Listening to the Mindset Advantage podcast with Elliot Rowe and Dr. Trisha Gardner. So, this week we have the second part of the Daniel Magrano interview, and he's going to be talking about a number of different topics. He's going to be talking about poker stars coming into New Jersey, which is obviously very significant news for the industry. Yeah, absolutely. I'm hoping that once New Jersey comes online, the rest of the country follows suit quick, fast, and in a hurry. Yeah, obviously, California hopefully isn't too far away, so you never know. Fingers crossed we'll see some poker stars in California. And then he'll also be looking at talking over some of the issues that have come up with poker stars, the changes to the software rules that are going to have pretty significant impacts on some of the regular players, the software that they've been using to play the number of tables they are and to have a significant advantage um, is going to be taken away from them. You know, it's so interesting that Daniel has been around the poker scene for so long that he's seen just about everything. And he has a really good insight about how policy changes can affect the game and the population as a whole, I think. It's definitely very interesting to hear someone with so much experience and obviously so much inside knowledge as well discuss the way he sees the future of the game going. So um, in psychology news, you can use what have you got this week, Tricia? Well, I have something that I think is going to be right up your alley, Elliot, and that is I want to talk about the right kind of visualization. Excellent. So we all know, you know, we're supposed to visualize things that we want, right? And, you know, the future that we want or things, you know, that we hope to gain or aspire to or whatever. But there's some very interesting research done around what actually makes visualization effective. And there's actually some dangers around just fantasizing about future success. And researchers have found that instead of just looking at what I want to have happen, what is a more effective way of using our visualization is to visualize the process. So you want to visualize yourself, let's say, uh, maybe you want to, you know, win a certain poker achievement, a bracelet or, you know, WPT championship or something of that nature. You should visualize yourself actually studying and gaining the required skills and knowledge that it's going to take to win that because what actually happens is when you visualize the process, you're then more likely to actually do those things. Whereas if you just visualize the end result, you're actually less likely to put in the work. I mean, that's really interesting. It's certainly something with hypnotherapy that I cover so much with clients. I think one of the sort of good examples of that is rather than just having clients visualize their success at the table, a lot of the time I'm actually having them visualize dealing with bad beats, perhaps at a final table and their reaction to it and how to get over that difficult situation. I mean, we had Brian Rast on the show, obviously, before talking about the work we'd done. And one of the things we'd gone over a lot was dealing with one of these huge bad beats at the final table, dealing with it appropriately and then coming back to win. And then um, obviously that actually happened there on three handed left and he hit that bad beat and dealt with it perfectly as he moved forward without tilting and and won that 7.25 million. So exactly the sort of thing that I'm talking about a lot there in, in my sessions. Isn't that amazing? You know, one thing I want people to notice is that a lot of times when we visualize an outcome, we operate under something called a planning fallacy, which means that we expect everything to be much easier than it actually is. And as Brian Rast shows, even the best can take a bad beat and it's not easy. And it's the visualizing getting over difficulties is far, far more important than just visualizing the perfect result. So um, something that comes up with the sports and and also obviously so much in poker as well. And just before we jump into the um, interview with Daniel, we're going to be running a webinar on the 21st. Myself and Dr. Tricia are going to be doing a webinar on downswings, helping people understand how to get through their downswings in poker and really understand how to take your game forward so that your mental game is much more resilient when those downswings, which unfortunately inevitably happen to all of us, hit your game. So if you're interested, check out pokermindcoach.com slash webinar. That's pokermindcoach.com slash webinar. So uh, on to the interview with Daniel. You know, it's very interesting because one of the models of psychotherapy that I really enjoy is an Adlerian model. And Alfred Adler, who originated that, said that, you know, if you wanted to be a success in life, you need to concentrate on love, 
work, and friendship. And really the whole thing that tied it together was a concept called Gemeinschaftsgefühl, which is social interest. And it sounds like that's where you've gotten to, where you are, you know, contributing to others. You know, you're not just working all the time, but you, you're calling friends or you're sharing advice. So I don't know if that resonates with you at all, but what you're saying, you know, is really kind of how it hits me. You know, absolutely. I think probably the most important question anyone can ask themselves, and it's one that most people don't even ponder even remotely, is what is your vision for your life? It's a, it's a simple statement, but when you, I promise when you ask people that question, they often look at you befuddled and go, uh, <laughs> I don't, uh, I don't know. Uh, uh. So if you don't know what your vision is for your life, if you don't know what it is you want to create in your life, how are you exactly going to do it? And for me, you know, I had a vision for my life a few years ago that's changed. You know, it evolves. It doesn't have to be the vision that's, you know, it, it can always evolve and change. And part of my vision is to be an inspiration to other people by living my life in such a way that I'm a billboard for what's possible and how to live a happy life and to contribute to the you know happiness and dreams of others to open people's eyes where they didn't see possibility for themselves to live a bigger better life and have that epiphany where they go wow oh my god I didn't realize that I could be I could do this and that's rewarding I mean I'm, that's you know ultimately what's the purpose of that it comes back to there's no such thing as a selfless act I'm doing this because it's going to make me feel good as well I'm making a difference for other people but I'm feeling like I'm living a life that, that matters. There's a documentary, a feature-length documentary coming out about you later in the year. Is it all about poker or is it covering those sorts of subjects as well? Well, that's a good question. I, I mean, I haven't seen the documentary yet. I know it's finished. And I think it's going to cover, it's, it's 90 minutes, so hopefully it covers some of the good juicy stuff in there. And I think it will. <laughs> I want to ask you uh, something that goes back to some of the, uh, a little bit of controversy around mental toughness. And and some people say that doesn't apply to poker. And I contend that it does apply to poker. And now I have you here. I want to ask you, how does mental toughness relate to poker? <laughs> I, I can't imagine anyone arguing that it doesn't at all. Because the thing is, is when does mental toughness really come into play? It doesn't really come into play so much when you're winning every pot making every flush, hitting every straight. When mental toughness really shows through and is important is when everything, all the cards are just spitting in your face and you're making you look like a fool with every move that you make. <laughs> now, mental toughness separates those that can't handle the stress of the swings of, of those situations. And it, allow, it affects their play so much that they end up, you know, as a result, playing worse. People that are mentally tough, they fight through those situations and realize, you know what? Okay, this will pass. I'm confident. I'm determined. I know that I'll get through this. I've been here before. The people that are not mentally tough crack, get into victim mentality, blame their bad luck, and they look at the people that are successful and say, you know what? They're just lucky. And, and, and I say to people that call me lucky, I say, yeah, if, if you want to call me lucky, then you're right. And I, and I agree. <laughs> <laughs> and in terms of that, are, are there sort of memories you have of final tables where you've seen the person sort of fade away or start to tilt? You, perhaps they have a bad beat and they lose the chip lead and things like that. Any sort of major memories of that? <laughs> I, I, I could list a million. But the one player that comes to mind when it comes to that, and he's famous for it, is the Mike Mattiso blow up where, you know, the, the wheels just fall off at times and he's just not the same player and it's all based on mental state and him losing that composure that he had based on you know a result that happened whether he made the right decision or wrong you know so it's it's prevalent amongst a lot of people i think like i said in the super high rollers that i play you just see it far less often than you do in uh, typical tournaments you know, one of the things that I talk about with a lot of my coaching clients is uh, self-sabotage. And I want to hear your take specifically around their sphere of failure, but even more so their sphere of success. Do you have any kind of ideas or opinions about people self-sabotaging themselves because of fear of success? Absolutely. I mean, back when in my, in my 20s, I remember there was a couple guys, I won't name them, but, you know, a couple guys that I would see, they would be grinding 20, 40 and then like a couple months later, they're boom, they're moving up, they're moving up, they're playing the one and 2000 games. And they've, they've built like a $5,000 bankroll into a million. Right. And then, you know, he starts drinking, getting some girls, doing some drugs, blow. And then like a week later, I'll see him playing 1530 again, starting all over doing this perpetually to himself, you know, starting going broke, building up a big bankroll, going broke again. And it, it's cyclical. And I wondered to myself, like, well, he was 40 at the time. And I thought, how long are you going to continue to do this for him? What is this about? And ultimately, I saw one correlation between him and several others that I saw do this. 
And the basis for it was they had no foundation, no vision, no bigger picture for their lives. And I, I had I experienced this myself to a much smaller degree. But so when they had no money, they had a clear vision and goal, right? Mm-hmm. Make money. I got to make some money. Now that they've made the money, there's nothing bigger than that. So they often sabotage themselves, blow up the money so that they now have a purpose again. They now have something, you know, to strive for. And uh, I remember, I think it was around 2000. I did that to myself on a much smaller scale and realized it was because I just didn't have any, any really foundation or base to make me want to live. Uh, I, I had nowhere to go from there. I was like, okay, so my goal all, this year, all these years was to make money. Now I got money. Now what? If you don't have a now what, you'll often find yourself repeating the same patterns of blowing it all away. I mean, it's something that it comes up quite a lot in the work I do, the regression work I do. There's also quite a substantial link to um, how your parents were around money. And if it was seen to be a good or a bad thing to be wealthy, there's a lot of people who have been brought up in a household where money's not necessarily seen as a good thing. And people who've been brought up that way, they can get the money, but they, they often find themselves finding ways of, of redistributing it. Um, I think with lottery winners, I, I think I've read it's 80% of lottery winners have lost all of the money um, after 10 years. Yeah, no, and I, you know, I think there's even another aspect of, of why people do that. And it's a lot of people, you know, don't necessarily like themselves, you know, or they don't love themselves. They have guilt they live with. They have regret. They feel like they're bad people. You know, deep down and part of them feels like they deserve to blow all this money. They deserve all the pain. And they don't, a lot of them don't feel they don't deserve the wealth. So as you know, you said earlier, uh, they they self-sabotage because there's, you know, the fear of success or they just don't feel like they deserve the success. It's so interesting because, you know, I, you know, that's why I got into psychology, because I think humans are just infinitely interesting and in the things that they do and, you know, trying to figure out why they do what they do and and helping them out. And it, it sounds like you've lived in like a psychology lab all these years and you've just seen everything. Well, I do a lot of reading myself. Like I'm very, you know, I, I love the the work. I love uh, the, the, the topic. It's something that I'm very passionate about. I've read a lot of books. And like I said, I did the course Choice Center three years ago, which I found to be, you know, I read a lot of books and that was powerful, but nothing put it together like doing the course did. And it really kind of uh, elevated my perspective on emotional intelligence, what makes people tick. And I think the biggest thing I got from it was really hammering home, you know, a couple key things and the difference between being a victim and standing responsible for everything. And when you say that to people, you go, well, hey, you know, I can't be responsible for everything. Not everything's my fault. Okay, I get what you're saying, but standing responsible means standing responsible 100% for your reaction to people, places, and events. And a victim is one who blames circumstance for everything in their life. And there's no power in that because if it's circumstance, you can't do anything to change that. So I think like living from responsibility and thinking, okay, what can I do to address the situation? How can I react better to change this or to do something about it? Now, I mentioned this once before and a lot of people, again, it's a controversial topic, but you know, if a, if a girl is raped at 15 years old, and she's now 35. And as a result, her life is a mess. Now, what the rapist did is horrifying. No one, it's disgusting. But if her life is at 35, still being affected in a, in a major way where she's unsuccessful because of that, she's leaving all of her power with the rapist, right? So she's not responsible for being raped. It's not her fault. No one would say that. But she is responsible ultimately for what she's going to do about it. You know, many people suffer that tragedy. And they don't always react the same way. Some use it as an empowering opportunity to help other women who have suffered through the same thing. Others, you know, it can absolutely destroy them. And this isn't a positive or negative that I'm, I'm saying like, I don't, I, you can't blame a woman who's 35 and is destroyed for it. But the understanding or the realization that she has the power and the ability to do something about it is where real change can come versus just accepting, you know, a gloomy, doomy fate. There's probably though the, the PTSD of the situation, don't you think? Sort of that sort of thing. Sometimes they need to work with therapists. They need to get over the PTSD, and and that could be what you know. It's the same with um, you know, people from who soldiers who've been at war and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a choice. So the choice is, do I go and get help? Do I go to see a therapist? Do I go to talk to somebody in support groups? Do I do something along those lines, or do nothing? So there is where the choice lies. And that's where people who live from responsibility will say, you know what, this is a horrible thing that happened to me, but here's how I'm going to react. I'm going to do my best to set my life back on a trajectory that's successful. And there's plenty of examples of, you know, young women who have had this tragic event happen to them that have succeeded and become big players in the world. 
You know, it's very interesting because Elliot brought up the post-traumatic uh, stress disorder, but there's also another body of research in psychology, which is around post-traumatic growth. And it's kind of what you're talking about, where you do have that fork in the road. And so some people, you know, they are in the post-traumatic stress for very long periods of time, but other people, they manage to go down what they call post-traumatic growth, which is where they are able to transition from that terrible experience and grow out of it. It's a very interesting topic. Yeah, there was a, there's actually a real real life example. Two women, many years ago, both with, you know, children, lost a son to a drunk driver. And, the, you know, Mother A, she was obviously distraught, and depressed. She had other children, but she basically checked out. She started drinking heavily, doing drugs, uh, was an absentee mother, and basically it had a, you know, destructive effect on the family. And who could blame her, right? I mean, we're right. not blaming her for that emotion. But the other woman had the exact same event happen. And what she did was she started what's called MAD which is Mothers Against Drunk Drivers. So it wasn't the event itself that caused either reaction. It was the person's choice, not, not only choice, but the way in which they reacted to the event is what set the trajectory for their lives, not the event itself. And, and I mean, it sort of leads quite beautifully back to the poker table as well, doesn't it? In terms of the idea that you can't choose your cards, you can't change the cards, but how you then continue to play after that is your own choice and is under your control. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you have a choice how to react, how you react to every situation. Like you said, you don't have a, you can't control which cards come out, but you can control your reaction to the result that's created, you know, and going all the way back to once I've set my intention, my intention is clear. And then I make sure that every decision I make, or I try my best to make sure every decision I make is in line with the intention that I said I wanted. So I want to win this tournament. I'm going to make sure that all the actions I do before that are in line with that. So drinking the night before a tournament. Is that in line with my vision? No. So if I'm doing that, I'm not living from my vision. I'm sabotaging myself. Exactly. Right? Mm. What about this term getting in the zone? You know, do you get in the zone? How do you get in the zone? You know, and how do you stay in the zone while you're playing, especially these long tournaments? Well, you know, and I do, and I, I think as humans, there's only so much intense focus that we're capable of. And like you said, some of these tournaments, you know, like the main event, you're talking about seven, eight days, 12 hour days. It's going to be a tall task to be, you know, hyper focused that entire time. So typically I go into a cruise control throughout several areas of the tournament where typically if I'm, you know, faced with new competitors that I've not seen before, I'm going to do my best to be in the zone for that moment. Once I've got a feel for them, I know that my brain might need a rest here and there. So I give it that rest. And I'm, I, what I'm doing is I'm essentially saving up a little bit also for when my adrenaline is going to kick in down to two, three tables. And uh, I've got an extra little boost of energy that will allow me to focus at a very, very hyper, hyper level for the rest for the remainder of the tournament. But I find it very difficult on day one to start out in hyper focus mode and be there for the duration of a tournament. Do you do anything on breaks to sort of revitalize yourself? We've had different professionals on and some of them like to talk to other people. Some of them like to isolate themselves, stay away from poker completely during the break. Do you have anything that you do? Well, this might surprise a lot of people, but I am a, I'm an absolute introvert. So my batteries are charged when I'm alone. My batteries are depleted when I'm around people. That's not to say I don't like being around people and being social and I'm not you know, I'm not good. I'm not shy, obviously, which a lot of people misconstrue what introvert means in that sense. But my batteries are charged. So on breaks, I like to be completely alone. That's why I got a trailer at the World Series so that I could still go through the back hallways and just rest for 15, 20 minutes. On dinner breaks, I never go to dinner with people. You know, people always say, oh, where are we going to go eat? They all go. But I find that if I went, I'd be talking, I'd be conversing, and I'd be draining myself of energy. So instead, I'll just be in solitude, sometimes maybe meditate for five to 10 minutes or maybe longer, or just relax and unplug so that I have the energy to um, be at my best when I play. So for me, it's definitely being alone. So what kind of advice would you have for someone who's just getting started in poker who would like to emulate your success? Well, the first and for first thing I'm, I would say is what's your vision? You know, and be very clear. I would say write it out. Two to three sentences describing what is your vision for your career, if, that's, if poker is what, it, what you want it to be. So describe that vision in real great detail. Then come up with a plan 
a written plan that would, you know, be benchmark sort of successes in terms of what you'll have to do. What we did when I did the course, a choice under the, during the 100 days, is we did what's called a PSP, which is a personal strategic plan, which you have your three month goal that you set. But then within that, you set weekly goals. And these goals are simply not, not even goals, but almost like chores. What I did was I had, for example, watch two hours of poker on television, uh, study hands, discuss them with a friend at least one hour a week. And I would schedule out those times. So start from the end game, which is what's your vision and then work backwards. And, uh, you know, obviously there, if you want to get more technical about what you need to do, and part of it is learn from people who've already done it. There's nothing wrong with taking on mentors. There's plenty of information available. Continue like having a support group of friends or people that you respect that will bounce back hands with you and, and, and have possibly have you see things in a different way. But really, it all starts from vision. You know, uh, is this something that you want to just do for fun? Is this something that you want as a, as a hobby, or is this something that you want to devote your life to? And depending what your answer is to that, that's going to dictate what your PSP would look like. If you want to devote your life to it, you should have eight to ten hours daily almost of work related to your career. If it's something you want to just get better at, maybe that looks like three, four hours a week of some study or things like that. So just get clear on what it is your vision is for yourself. Um, one of the things you mentioned there was the mentors. And uh, I know you, an interview had come out this week about you talking about the people who should be writing poker books. Um, could you expand on that a little bit? Well, yes. I mean, it was in reference to you know the types of things that you guys are doing, you know, what you're doing is really applicable to people who are in NASCAR, people who are in sports, people that play poker. The fact that, you know, you, whether or not you guys are high level players is completely irrelevant because you're focusing on mental state. Now, conversely, if you're writing strategy, if you were to write books on how to play ace queen and what the best way is, you it's certainly imperative. shouldn't buy it from me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's absolutely <laughs> imperative that the person that you're studying from has proven a track record that his methods work. I mean, think about it. Would you go to the gym and see, you know, that your trainer is morbidly obese, has a donut in his mouth and a cigarette in the other with a, with a whiskey telling you to do push-ups? Is this really the guy that you feel like might be the best trainer for you? I don't think so. And in poker, we have lots of uh, literature out there and some of it's outdated and some of it's written by people who are discussing topics that they have no firsthand knowledge of. You know, for example, so if someone like that's never played a super high roller, is going to write a book saying how to beat super high rollers. Do you really want to buy that book? So the, the whole point of my blog was to really look deeper into who's writing, who, whose information are you soaking in and what's their basis for it being valid at all. And I think that to some degree, especially for high level poker, the only ones that could teach it are the ones that are capable of doing it. It's different than golf. You know, you could get a golf coach who's not very good because he's got physical limitations, but understands the golf swing better than anyone else. That's not true with poker. Speaking of golf, you play quite a lot of golf, don't you? I haven't played since May. First it was a finger and now it's a wrist. <laughs> oh, okay. So you've had a little time off. But, you know, I was just wondering, do you find having come up and really perfected your poker game and all the lessons you learned around that, did that transfer over to golf? Oh, there's a lot of parallels between golf. And I remember Tiger Woods, he was asked a question and I really like Tiger Woods by the way, he was asked a question, you know, someone said, because when he, he, when he putts, he typically like, you know, really goes for the putt and he'll, he'll hit the putt several feet past the hole where, you know, most people say you should make sure you get it close so you don't miss the next putt. And he said, you know, people, when he said, how can you be so aggressive on these putts? And he said, cause I'm not thinking about the next one. He's mm -hmm. focused on doing everything he can to make the putt that he's facing right in the moment, shot by shot. And the, you know, the parallel for poker essentially is, you know, you obviously have your overriding intention of winning the tournament, but you have to be in the moment and make the best possible decision in the moment without thinking about down the road, you know, what this would mean or what that would mean. You just have to make the right decision in the moment. Uh, just sort of um, bringing it back to other sort of recent news, obviously we saw that PokerStars has got into New Jersey this week. How do you think that's going to, one, change the New Jersey market? Do you think that's going to help bring poker back to America or other, other states opening up and things like that? Well, I think it's a great step. I think PokerStars as an organization is a tip-top organization. I've met with the CEO, David Bazoff. I know, you know his vision for the company and its growth. And frankly, I don't know if people realize this or not, but it would have been very unlikely if uh, the takeover hadn't happened that PokerStars ever would have gotten back in New Jersey. 
But uh, with Amaya, a reputable company, you know, now owning PokerStars and it's, it being on the stock exchange, I think that opened the door for them to get into New Jersey, which bodes well for, you know, states like California and, and Nevada. And also, you know, with PokerStars being a legitimate player in the United States, all the financial support and other support that's necessary in terms of getting any political change done, they now can, you know, contribute to that in a more meaningful way, I think. Do you think that poker will become available in every state in the union or do you think it's going to continue to be, you know, here or there states have it and and a lot of states don't? Well, I mean, I don't know. Obviously, I can only speculate and uh, a lot of it is so dependent upon, you know, the law. But uh, Mm -hmm. I I certainly don't think you're going to see any federal changes in the next year with the, you know, with it being an election year. I don't think that anyone is going to make online poker their platform, uh, you know, (laughs) for presidency. (laughs) (laughs) It ranks very low on their list. So I don't know if it will get to the federal stage for quite some time. But I think if you are able to get the major states like California, New York, New Jersey, Nevada on board, that represents a large player base. And if you know we can get them to be playing interstate, now you've got a really solid base that could lead to more and more states jumping on board. And then maybe from there, something at the federal level. But As of now, I don't think that at the federal level it has uh, a lot of chance, especially I don't see any, you know, near future promise in that area. And how do you feel about sort of poker as a as a growth sport or industry? You know, are you seeing changes in the live game? I know the World Series we had we had the huge events uh, this year, or or is there are there concerns that you know perhaps perhaps things are getting a little bit quieter? Well, I mean, I think poker has changed a lot in the sense that it's more global. You know, it used to be. Uh, you know, in Las Vegas, that's where you played poker, maybe in California, but now it's, it's a global game. So people are spread out across the world. So while, you know, a lot of people are talking about tournament numbers, maybe being down in some areas, they're not realizing that in the old days when the world poker tour was around, there was nothing else. So people from Europe were flying to, you know, to the, you know, to the United States to play in events. Well, now they have the European poker tour in their own backyard. So, and there's a lot of overlapping events. So we may see numbers per event down, but overall growth of play continue to be fine. As for online poker, there's definitely been a downward shift for the last few years in terms of the number of players. But the real issue there is as simple as when you have so many, you know, winning players playing, you, you know, there's, there's only a select number of losing players and the focus, and I've said this for many, many years before the change, the focus needs to be not as much on the professional players and making them happy, but on making recreationals more interested in depositing and playing again. Because when you have recreational players playing, the pros will be there anyway. So I wouldn't incentivize uh, the pros as much as, as, as they are. I would incentivize depositing players who are typically recreational players. They would be my focus because with them, the pros are there anyway. And, and do you think that's deposit bonuses or tournaments of only people who are newcomers to the site? Or you know, how would you how would you see that well, yeah, there's definitely several ways to do that, and you, and you hit on a couple. Obviously, uh, you know, deposit bonuses is one area, and there's other some other creative ideas that I will I'm not privileged to you know share with you right now, but some ideas that will definitely um, sway, I would say, the the pendulum of benefits for which type of player. And I think there will be some voices who are not happy about it, but if they look at it from a bigger picture scenario and realize that. The ecology, the way that it's set up right now, we have a lot of players. Well, they're not even making a lot of money. They're just taking a lot of money out of the system because of VIP bonuses and other things like that. And the rate at which losing players are losing money online has risen an astronomical percentage. They're just getting killed way too quickly. And a lot of that has to do with the balance of uh, too many. There's so many break even and winning players that the dynamic makes it much more difficult for a recreational player to have any winning sessions at all. And do you think this, um, the cha- the recent changes in the software will help as well? Because I know a lot of the professional software tools have been banned over the last few months on PokerStars. Well, obviously, and, I, and, I, and to be frank, I think the, the move that Full Tilt Poker made was, was genius. They got completely got rid of their heads-up tables. They've eliminated seat selection by essentially saying, if you want to play 510, put your name on the list. Just like if you were to go to Bellagio and you said you want to play 510, you join a list, and when a seat opens up, you take the seat, or you don't. You know, you don't have to. You could always not play. But uh, what that does is it really curbs seat scripting, which has become a, a rampant cancer to online games, where pros essentially, anytime a recreational player sits, 
within a second or automatically sitting at that table with that player and fleecing them as quickly as possible. The same with heads-up tables. These players, you know, they're not bringing in any revenue in the sense that they're playing each other. What they're doing is they're taking a recreational player and eliminating him rapidly because heads-up, you know, the advantage is so strong for a player. So getting rid of all that is going to make the game more recreational player friendly and their player experience is going to be vastly improved to, the, to what they've experienced over the last few years. Well, well the, the losing players have to have a reason to come back to the casino, don't they? It's a bit like people don't spend as much on slot machines as they will on Baccarat because they feel they've, they've at least got a shot. Well, absolutely. You know, so if you, if you were uh, playing in a 1-2 No Limit game on Poker Stars and you're a recreational player and you play like you know, two-hour sessions for like seven straight days and you lose all seven sessions, which is likely to happen uh, in the state of the game the way they are, are you really going to – you're going you're gonna to know, you're going to feel it after seven days that this ain't luck. I'm just – I'm getting wamboozled by hustlers and I can't beat these guys, which is different than something like you know, daily fantasy sports, which has obviously been uh, booming of late where people you – know, they, don't, they don't feel it so immediately even though the rake is very high and, and they have other issues on their own. But um, they don't feel it so quickly because they're like, oh, you know, if Tony Romo would have just caught that ball, I might have won this or that, right? They don't realize that there are hustlers and, and you know, that are just really, really good at picking winners in daily fantasy because it's, it's not as immediate and as personal as it is when you sit at a poker table and lose seven straight days. You know, I want to ask you about another segment of the player pool or potential player pool and, and get your insights on it. And that's women in poker. You know, women in poker, not as many women as probably a lot of people would like. What do you think could be done to attract more women to the game? Well, to be honest, online poker has been a, a big boon in, in a sense to uh, raising the amount of women who play poker uh, because it's an, it's sort of like for a lot of women, I believe, and you know, correct if I'm wrong, it can be intimidating to walk into a casino with a bunch of men, you know, hearing sexist jokes and maybe feeling uncomfortable about not knowing how to bet, not really doing it. So the, you know, playing online is an easy way because when you're behind the screen, you know, it's gender neutral. So that's, I think, one way. But really, it just comes down to, I, I think, the makeup of men and women and what we are, whether it's based on society, whether it's based on, you know, our brains being different, are typically less drawn to things like poker than, than they would be other things. And that's not, that's not either good nor bad. It just typically, I would say this is, I mean, a, a generalization to some degree, but I would say that men are typically more competitive than women. You know, we see more men typically wanting to play sport, wanting to play football, wanting to play hockey, wanting to play basketball. Women do as well, but I think it's a smaller percentage that tend to be attracted to competitive endeavors like sport. That's an interesting, you know, point of view. And I'm not sure what the right answer is, but, uh, but I would like to see more women in the game. So hopefully more women will get in there. Well, I do think also ladies events, and I know a lot of people are detractors of them. I think they're fabulous, you know, and I get, you know, there's nothing that precludes a woman from being just as good as a man or vice versa. But these women's events have history and the women who play them really seem to enjoy being around a bunch of women. Like every time I've you know been around one, they seem to be just having a blast and really having fun and feeling comfortable. And, and I don't think that we should, you know, because a lot of people are talking about getting rid of ladies events. I think that's a huge mistake. I think uh, it doesn't hurt anyone. I don't think it sends a message at all that women are inferior. I think that it's just an entryway to what has been since we've known it, a typically, you know, male dominated industry. And then sort of from your side, Daniel, the, the, the sort of the short term future, um, what have you got going on in the next few months? Well, I've been taking a lot of time off, actually. This is the probably this is going to end up being the fewest events I've played in my career since 2000. It's probably the first, the lowest number of events played. And I'm doing other things, you know, work physically. I'm, I'm at the gym a lot. I'm playing soccer. Uh, I'm involved in, you know, this NHL deal to Las Vegas. I'm, I'm doing this uh, TV series called The Four Kings where I pl have some cameo role. Well, I'm actually just an actor in it. You know, I'm also doing some coaching whenever I get the opportunity to do that. But a little less travel and more just being a homebody and, uh, you know, living the dream life that I always sort of envisioned. That as you visualized. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Like literally I am living the dream life that I chose, that I wanted when I was – you know, 18, 19 years old. I'm, I've actualized it and I've realized it. And uh, I'm really, you know, one of the things I did actually, or I used to say was, because this was my, you know, my dream life a couple of years ago. I was like, you know what? I wish I could live that dream life. And then I, you know, but I always travel and travel keeps me away from doing things like playing in soccer leagues and whatnot. But then I thought to myself, well, why couldn't I? 
I can just choose to live my dream life. So that's what I've been just focusing on is just doing that. And I still love to play and I'm always going to be, you know, playing the big events, but it doesn't dominate my life because my self-worth isn't attached to my poker results quite as strongly as it was 10, 15 years ago. Well, it's, it's, as I say, amazing to hear the amount of information you've shared today is just awesome for the listeners. And again, do you, do you have any ideas on release dates for the film or anything, or is that still? Well, it's done. They're working on distribution, I believe. And there's a few people interested and, you know, I'd like to see it be out very shortly, but uh, it really just depends. I'm not sure where it's going to land. There's a few people interested. So, and that's not up to me. That's, you know, out of my hands. So what was that thing you said we needed to write our personal strategic plan? A PSP. So yeah, a PSP essentially, and you could break it up into however you want. But what we did when we did the course was it was a three month plan. So for example, let's just use weight because that's typical for a lot of people. Say in the next three months, I want to lose 20 pounds, right? Maybe that's your goal for some people. So now that's the goal. Now they're going to work back to a personal strategic plan by week. So what is week one? What is What am I going to need to do to do that? So that includes three hours of running, two hours of weight training, lowering my calorie intake to this and losing four pounds week one, six pounds week two. So you have these little benchmarks. So you start with the, you know, the vision, the end goal, which is the 20 pounds. And then you create the benchmark and you're going to, you're going you're to be off track at times on track, off track. And then you just course correct. So if you know you didn't quite get what you needed to do in week two done, you know, you compensate and maybe add it to week three so that you're back on track with, you know, what you know you need to do to, to achieve the goal. Okay, so I'm going to work on this and I hope all of our listeners are going to do a PSP as well. You know what's really fun, and I'll tell you, it's really, really powerful, is if you do a PSP, PSP pick a partner to do it with. Pick okay. somebody that, you know, a friend of yours that wants to do something on their own, a PSP. And then maybe, you know, Mondays you check in with each other and Fridays you check in with each other to hold each other accountable, you know? So if you're saying, well, you know what, I couldn't do my push-ups, couldn't do my yoga today, I was, uh, the other person can maybe chime in and say, what was more important to you than keeping your word to yourself? that you were going to do this. Right. So right. I think it's valuable because it's easy to just quit on yourself. I mean, it's much easier, as you said, like the whole, what the hell, right. right. But if you have somebody else that's there with you and, and they're, you know, holding each other accountable, I, I think it increases the chances you'll be successful. Excellent. Excellent stuff. And where can people find your blog, Daniel? Oh, my blog, uh, it's fullcontactpoker.com. Yeah. I don't write as much as I used to, but, uh, yeah, man, you know, you're, you've inspired me. Maybe I'm going to write one. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent stuff. Um, well, thank you so much for coming on the show today. It has really been a joy having you on. And, yeah, we're looking forward to seeing you win lots of bracelets next year. I appreciate it, guys. It was fun. I enjoy it. I, I appreciate the work you guys are doing, and I think it's really important. And I'm very supportive of the whole area because I think what you're doing is you're changing lives aside from making people better poker players. Okay. Thank you thank so you much. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thanks, Daniel. Bye. You got it, guys. Bye. So excellent stuff from Daniel there. It's so interesting to hear his views on the game. And I think it's been really useful for us and, and also hopefully for the listeners in terms of understanding how it is to be an elite player for so many years. You know, not only that, but you can really see the work that has gone into his game. And it's so interesting because a lot of people that were in the game, you know, as Daniel was coming up, they're no longer in the game. And you know, if they are, they're certainly not winners, but most of them have gone by the wayside. And yet Daniel manages somehow year after year to stay at the top of that leaderboard. And you can see just how much effort he puts into his mindset. It's something that almost sounds as significant as the work he puts into his technical game. So it's just something to be very, very aware of. You know, this is what the elite are doing in poker. This is what the most successful players are doing to make sure they keep making money at the table. You know, I think you just pointed out something that's very important, and I don't want to gloss over it. Once you have the technical aspects down, and it's not like you ever really have them down, you always have to keep working. But once you get a lot of that under your belt, it is really time to put as much, if not more, focus on the mental side. Certainly. I mean, it's something that can definitely pay off once you have uh, that real technical understanding. So if you enjoyed our show, please um, add us and subscribe on iTunes so you can have the shows delivered to you every week to your iPhone. And check out our webinar that's going to be on the 21st, and that's on Downswings. Again, that's pokermindcoach.com slash webinar. We'll talk to you next week. Bye, guys. You've been listening to the Mindset Advantage podcast with Elliot Rowe and Dr. Tricia Gardner. To get any resources mentioned in the episode or to listen to past shows, visit pokermindcoach.com forward slash TMA podcast. Thanks for listening.